Thank you for that warm welcome. I've had people all over the place tonight congratulating me on my birthday. I appreciate that, it was not my birthday. <laughs> but if you want to celebrate, well, that's fine with me. So a great a blessing to be here uh, in this service tonight and uh, see uh, familiar faces, the wonderful uh, works that God has done, pastors and workers that we become acquainted with, and I'm so appreciative of the invitation that Anthony has extended. Uh, Pastor Tilly furnishes leadership in this area, uh, and it's a great blessing to be here. I just uh, uh, preached in uh, Sydney. They have a conference going on just now, and uh, God doing good things there. And I believe tonight that in this conference we're going to see the hand of God powerfully move. I know Pastor Camel has been preaching, and you uh, have received tremendous ministry and are refreshed by that. If you have your Bibles tonight, I want you to turn with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 49. This is a uh, messianic uh, passage of Scripture. But in the scripture that we're going to read, uh, there are tremendous principles that we want to look at. Uh, I remember in the Perth Conference, Pastor Camel preached on this uh, passage of scripture. Uh, there may be some uh, similarities in the things I'm going to say tonight. But this is a messianic uh, passage of scripture. It has to do with our Lord Jesus Christ. But it also has tremendous meaning and principles for you and I, Isaiah 49. I have a story uh, that I clipped out of a man in America. He owns uh, six, I believe, six McDonald's restaurants. And this man was uh, looking at the uh, cooking oil that uh, is a waste product and thinking about how this could be used and he began to experiment at home and he developed a process that in that uh, home process he developed fuel for his automobile and began to burn this cooking oil as reprocessed in a home development project and he said these words he said I did not do this for money. Listen very carefully. He said, I just want to be able to say I made a difference, a contribution in life. And as we read those words, this touches a deep note in every one of us sitting in this building. There's something in the human personality that wants to be something more than just simply passing through life and no significant thing happening that they could look back on and say, as this man, I made a difference. Listen to the statement this man made. He said, I'm not looking for the recognition, Lenini said. I'm looking for the thought process that when I leave this earth, is it any better than when I got here? There is a woman was born into this world handicapped. Her name was Helen Keller. Marvelous story. And she made a very significant statement. She said, I long to accomplish a great and noble task, but it is my chief duty and joy to accomplish humble tasks as though they were great and noble. For the world is moved along not only by the mighty shoves of its heroes, but also by the aggregate uh, of tiny pushes uh, of each honest worker. Now verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 49 says, Listen, O coastlands, to me, and take heed, you people from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. He has made mention of my name. And he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand he's hidden me and made me a polished shaft in his quiver he's hidden me. And he said to me, 
You are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Yet surely my just reward is with the Lord and my work with my God. Here is a statement about the possibility of a significant life. I want to talk to you about a life of significance tonight. And first of all, if you're going to do anything that is significant in life, you're going to have to have what God requires, which is a preparation of your character. It's a major, major error made in life. And uh, you and I are about conferences where we challenge workers, we raise up workers. Uh, and the error is made that as soon as my name is announced, uh, my ministry doesn't start until I'm announced. And so this view is this evening uh, that unless you are appointed to an office uh, or unless you fulfill some kind of appointment, uh, that your ministry does not begin and that is a major error because all of a Christian life is a ministry. Here in this text there is a tremendous statement that what you're going to do for God is linked and connected to the development of your character. I uh, am very interested in bu bumper stickers. I was traveling along and uh, I saw this bumper sticker. Do they have bumper stickers in Australia? Okay. So uh, I'm traveling along, I see this bumper sticker, and uh, this bumper sticker says, everything is connected. Said, I'm not sure that's true. <laughs> I travel a great deal in the airports, I see uh, different kinds of people, and I'm not sure that everything's connected. <laughs> Matter of fact, I see some people that I'm sure there's nothing connected. <laughs> But having said that, uh, as we look into this passage of Scripture in verse 2, it uh, speaks a word about a polished shaft. This has to do with an arrow. Pastor Camel marvelously preached a masterpiece in Perth uh, and went through details of the preparation uh, of an arrow and illustrated this with the equipment that he brought in, feathers thing. If the customs had caught him, he'd still be in jail. <laughs> But he gave the detail of the preparation uh, that is uh, re referred to here. And I want to point out that an arrow is an instrument, and that instrument is for a specific purpose. Uh, it is to be used in a specific time frame, uh, not for archery, but is used in a time of war. When I was a boy, there was a field next to uh, where I lived in Prescott, Arizona. And when it rained, you could go out in that field and you could find maybe one or two arrowheads that had come to the surface. And this seemed to be somehow the rain was able to bring this up, or maybe they were visible, I'm not sure. But a mighty battle must have taken place in that field. And arrowheads could be found. Of course, they had no shaft. This was in ancient history of some kind. But there were instruments, and those instruments were instruments of war, and they were used in a specific time, and as they were used, they were aimed at, and it was dependent that they would be hit the mark. And this is the imagery that we have, a preparation of character so that God can use us in a strategic moment for His purposes. There is in this passage of Scripture a reference to you and I as an individual. Every single person sitting in this building is being prepared by God for a use, whether you fully understand that or whether you do not. And in verse 1, he refers in a tremendous statement, says, The Lord has called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. He's made mention of my name. Now there's two factors uh, that we need to look at for a moment. One of those uh, has to do with a process. When David uh, was uh, fighting Goliath on the battlefield, he stopped at the brook Elath, uh, and as he stopped, he picked up, the Bible says, five smooth stones, uh, 
And this is extremely significant. He did not reach down and grab any kind of stone that was there because uh, a stone, uh, uh, to reach its target, had to have the trajectory that, that was undeterred. Uh, and he picked up five smooth stones. Think for a moment now about the process uh, of the hundreds and the thousands of years uh, those stones were in preparation. Uh, and David did not just pick up any stone that might cause uh, the trajectory to go off. He's going against Goliath. And when he fired that shot, uh, he was dependent upon that shot hitting its mark. Uh, and that's why he picked up five smooth stones that were processed uh, by God uh, by time. Now, we don't have any problem. We do realize this business of time. But connected with this process uh, is the factor uh, that uh, there is something that has to come to pass in lives uh, whereby a process is God begins to process our life. We don't mind the time, but we don't like the circumstances that bring this to pass. You see, God, in the preparation of you and I and our character, he brings the events of life uh, that begin to shape us, uh, and we understand the time frame, but we don't like that shaping. Uh, we don't like that, uh, that uh, uh, business of God uh, saying, I don't like this about you. I don't like that about you. If you're going to be used of God, uh, you're going to have to submit to my process uh, in preparation. This is a second element uh, that we need to look at, and this has to do with your own choice. You make choices in life uh, about what you're going to do, what you're going to be involved in, uh, and this is crucial to the development of your character. Listen to this quote, if you will, for a moment. It says, uh, we wonder why people of faith aren't making mo uh, more of an impact in the culture. When the answer clearly lies in how we spend our time. Somewhere along the line, uh, the church substituted events for discipleship. Flip through the pages of a typical Christian magazine or watch Christian TV and you'll find plenty of church happenings. I love events myself, but they don't make disciples of people. Relationships do. I love the media, but we'll never develop relationships uh, or deepen our walk with Christ uh, if we don't put limits uh, upon what we do. Rethink how you use the media and then prioritize your time in the context of your Christian life. Uh, computers, the internet, email, TV and radio are great tools and churches uh, and ministries of all kinds uh, are using them to reach unbelieving culture. But media is ultimately about influence. And clearly what we choose to expose ourselves to will have the dominant power in our lives because the truth is uh, at the end of your days uh, when you stand in front of your creator, how important it will it be that you never missed an episode of Oprah. Now, there is a potent factor that is involved, and that potent factor is the God factor. That is the process uh, that God forces us into in the events of life that shape and mold our character, but there also is a choice that we make, and that choice that we make uh, is going to determine uh, what we're going to be used for and the significance of the life that we're going to live, uh, and this is not automatic. In the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 21 says, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified uh, and useful for the master, prepared uh, for every good work. As you look into this scripture uh, tonight, you hear and see and understand the record of Abraham. You understand and see the record of Moses. You see David, other uh, great men of the Bible, individuals that have been used, uh, women that have been powerfully used of God. Uh, 
And we could call out Deborah, and we could call out Esther, we could call out others. Uh, but all of these uh, have been shaped in their character so that in a strategic moment, uh, God could bring to pass uh, his destiny. Uh, and I want to tell you that tonight uh, that this is linked to your character, and character is something that's developed. I want to point out to you something else for a moment, and that is faithfulness uh, in obscurity. This is something that uh, uh, you have to consider, and uh, this is one of the most prominent things in the Bible. You and I, as we're here, have a great struggle in life, and that struggle is a search for meaning. Every individual that is here has a natural desire to have some kind of significance in their life. Uh, they want to accomplish something so that they can look back. Uh, and as a matter of fact, those who deal in human personality say it's absolutely crucial for elements that we have to have in life. One of these is we have to love and be loved. The second is uh, that we have to accomplish something in life that we can look and see that we're trading our life for something that is significant, uh, that will be accomplished. Thirdly, uh, uh, we have to have uh, uh, some kind of recognition. We long to be recognized for what we're doing and who we are. And uh, fourthly, uh, we need adventure. We need to launch off into uh, uh, something that's uncertain, whereby there's an element of risk uh, that is involved. So here we have in this scripture, uh, the understanding uh, of the visibility uh, that we long to have uh, so that we have meaning in our lives and we look for some kind of accomplishment uh, that we're trading our lives for. And uh, here is where we have the greatest struggle. Someone wrote a cliche, and they said, He that tooteth not his own horn, the same shall not be tooted. This is a little cliche that reveals this longing in human personality. Uh, uh, hey, you, you know, it's me. I'm, 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 I'm accomplishing something. But the difficulty is in a great deal of life, no one's going to know what you're doing. They're not going to recognize you. You're not going to be, uh, uh, your name is not going to be named. You're not going to be uh, elevated. You're not going to have any pr uh, a platform. And this is a very profound element. Verse 2 says these words, In his quiver he has hidden me. And you need to note and mark down tonight uh, that not being used at the moment uh, does not mean that you're not valued by God. Think with me for a moment about this element. In the shadow of his hand, uh, he has hidden me. And there's a long history in the Bible uh, that you need to come to grips with if you're going to do a work for God, uh, because probably most of the labor that you, you, uh, that you do is not going to be recognized uh, until God uh, brings it to pass in his own period of time. In the Bible, we have a man whose name is John the Baptist. And the Bible gives us this verse upon this man, Luke 1, verse 80. So the child grew and became strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his manifestation to Israel. Now, many uh, 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 commentators feel that John the Baptist uh, was developed uh, in the community of Qumran, uh, which is there in the desert uh, right next to the Dead Sea. And uh, this, uh, this is, uh, can't be proven. But we do know that when he began his ministry, he was just a few miles, maybe five or six or seven miles uh, up the Jordan River from that where he was baptizing. And the Bible says that John the Baptist was in the desert until the time of his uh, manifestation to Israel. And when he came to that place baptizing on the Jordan River, uh, multitudes came out. All of Judea and all of Jerusalem came out to hear this man, uh, but he was not recognized uh, until uh, God revealed him. He was in the desert places. 
The Apostle Paul, the Bible says, followed this pattern in Galatians 1, 17 and 18. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia. And I returned again to Damascus, to Jerusalem, to see Peter, and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles uh, except James, uh, the Lord's uh, brother. Now, it's in the discipline that we have learned in the times of obscurity that God shapes us and God forms us and the lessons that are learned in obscurity prepares us for the time of ministry that we're going to have so that we will be faithful in the time that God finally brings us into what he has for us. Jesus emphasized this uh, in the book of John, chapter, uh, uh, chapter 12, verse 24. He said, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth uh, much fruit. Uh, and contained in that profound scripture is the essence of uh, this business of obscurity uh, and uh, the scripture says that's a necessity uh, that we must go through. Listen to this commentary of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus came out of the uh, little city of Nazareth. And commentators say that when Jesus was born in Nazareth, there probably was no more than 500 people uh, in this city. Uh, there's not many in it today. But listen to the commentary upon the life uh, of that single individual. Jesus of Nazareth, without money and arms, conquered more millions than Alexander the Great, Caesar, Mohammed, and Napoleon. Without science and learning, he shed more light on things human and divine than all philosophers and scholars combined. Without the eloquence of school, he spoke such words of life as were never spoken before or since and produced effects which lie beyond the reach of orator or poet. Without writing a single line, he set more pens in motion and furnished theme for more sermons, orations, discussions, learned volumes, works of art, and songs of praise in the whole army uh, of great men uh, of ancient and uh, modern times. Now think about this for a moment uh, because we have the idea in our, in our head uh, that we have to come from some eloquent background. Uh, we have to be shaped uh, by the learned uh, uh, scholars of our day. Uh, but here we have an example of a life that came out uh, of an obscure village uh, in Israel uh, and the disciples follow in that pattern. When the disciples of Jesus Christ begin to preach, uh, there's something about them uh, that the religious schools of the day looked upon these men uh, and they marveled at them uh, and they marveled at the effect they were having uh, and they said uh, and took note uh, that these men had been uh, with Jesus uh, because there's something about faithfulness uh, in obscurity uh, that shapes and forms a character that God can use you uh, for the ministry that he has for you. Now, this is crucial to understand something that I want to point out for a moment from this text. Uh, and if you're going to do this, you have to maintain a cutting edge uh, in life. Now, this is the hard part. Time takes its toll uh, in human personality. Some of you I've known uh, for a number of years and you don't look the same as you did. <laughs> you look different now. Your hair is leaving your head. <laughs> your chest has fallen into your drawers. <laughs> and time is taking its toll. Now, this is the crucial factor tonight in you and I. I've been saved many, many years. I've pastored the same church uh, for many, many years. And the sad fact is uh, that sometimes those whom God is using, they're on the very cutting edge of what God's doing. In the process of time, you see time begins to take its toll. In the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 10, verse 10, says, If the ax is dull and one does not sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength, uh, but wisdom brings uh, success. 
Now, whether this is a razor, whether this is an ax, whether this is a knife, whether it's a pair of scissors, uh, it is a fact uh, that time and uh, use uh, begins to dull uh, and they lose uh, that cutting edge. And this is a crucial issue. Uh, look at the scripture that is there. God has made my mouth as a sharp sword. Now we're in Australia tonight and don't get upset at me. I don't hate Australian. I just want to bring out a fact about Australians. In Australia, there's a process that is at work uh, and it's called the egalitarian concept. What that means is uh, that uh, mediocrity has been elevated to a sacred dimension uh, and if you dare to begin to rise above uh, and you begin to excel, uh, then something begins to take place, uh, which is the tall poppy syndrome. Uh, they must take the edge off of you, bring you down to the level of mediocrity. Uh, it's called egalitarianism. You and I are called by God to excel. Can you say amen? You and I are called by God to begin to reach the potential that God has for us, uh, not simply fit in with the crowd, uh, but God calls us uh, to maintain uh, a cutting edge in our lives uh, so that we continue the rest of our lives to be uh, what God has called us to be. And I probably am going to preach a sermon called Longevity. And in that sermon, I bring out the fact that God intends and has designed you not to simply grow old, fat, uh, and dull, uh, and uh, just go your way, uh, and uh, finally you go off into insignificance. Uh, but God calls you as long as you breathe a breath uh, to maintain a cutting edge for God. I worked years ago in Lockheed Aircraft in Burbank, California. This was a uh, on a flight line in a factory, they were producing uh, transports for Pan Am, uh, TWA, American Airlines, uh, and uh, other airlines. Uh, and I worked on the flight line, and uh, this flight line was so that when the factory was finished uh, putting them together, we worked out all the bugs of the systems, uh, and then the factory uh, or the uh, company representative uh, came and signed off and uh, uh, and, and uh, accepted the aircraft that it was complete and it was functional. I was trained by the military to be a flight line electrician. I developed that skill uh, in the military. And very soon, on, uh, on, uh, we're working there, there were probably eight or ten planes at a time that were being uh, done. They had a crew chief and a crew that worked on that. And uh, something uh, took place which is very interesting to me. They began to discover that I could produce. It's very unique in the generation in which we live. <laughs> I always believe that if you uh, get, got eight hours pay, you ought to do eight hours work. I know that's a novel concept, but I always <laughs> believed that. They began to discover that I could produce, I could troubleshoot electrical circuits, uh, and suddenly other crew chiefs began to say, uh, we, want, we want him to come over and help us. Can you work an extra shift? Can you work overtime? Uh, and uh, what they did was suddenly they put a spotlight on me as just simply an individual who was just doing the job that I was paid to do. And an interesting thing took place. Men who I was working with, began to say to me, hey, slow down. You're killing the job. <laughs> Are you following me tonight? There's something that God intends for you, and that is the full potential that you have uh, to be maintained. And here is the ability, as spoken in the scripture, to speak words uh, that affect change. Uh, and when he says, he's made my mouth as a sharp sword, it has tremendous significance for you and I tonight. Listen to Ephesians 6 and verse 17. And take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, it is obvious that you're not going to be able to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, unless you have read it. 
Not only that you have read it, uh, but you have uh, caused it to be uh, a part of your personality uh, so that the Holy Spirit can take uh, the Word of God, uh, make it a sharp two-edged sword in your hand, uh, and it be used uh, for God. In the book of Hebrew, chapter 4, verse 12, says the Word of God uh, is living and powerful and sharper than into any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So here we have uh, this imagery whereby human beings uh, are to be an instrument in the hand of God, uh, and they're able to speak, and as they speak, uh, they're able to pierce uh, beyond the veneer uh, of the front that people put up, uh, and uh, the Holy Spirit can use uh, to reach into the deeper regions of the heart. In the day of Pentecost, when Peter stood up to preach, he stood up, and as he stood up to preach, he began to preach, and the Bible says this interesting word, as they heard him speak, they were cut to the heart. Or another translation says, they were stabbed in their heart. So there's something involved here. And uh, this is a profound understanding uh, that not only were they just speaking words, uh, but as Colossians 3.16 says, uh, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing uh, one another in psalms and hymns uh, and spiritual songs, singing uh, with grace uh, in your hearts uh, to the Lord. So here we have then... Uh, as the scripture says, uh, he's made my mouth uh, as a sharp sword. Uh, that's not an automatic thing. This is something that you and I are called to. How many believe we're called uh, to proclaim the word of God? Whether we be a pastor, whether we be an evangelist, or whether we simply be a member of a congregation, God has called us uh, to take this glorious book whereby he's revealed himself to humanity and speak it so that uh, they're cut to the heart or they're convicted uh, or who they are is exposed uh, before God. There's one added dimension I want to bring to this. There's an interesting little side note uh, that is here, and this is found in Psalms 27 uh, and verse 17. It says, as iron sharpens iron, uh, so a man sharpens the countenance uh, of his friend. Here's something else that is uh, fed into the mix, uh, and that is it is relationship uh, with our fellow man that begins to keep that cutting edge. Uh, you know, it's interesting uh, the, some of the doctrines that uh, float around today. If you want to uh, 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 stay on a cutting edge, uh, bounce some of your, uh, your pet doctrines uh, uh, by your fellow man and let them have a shot at it. Because there's something about uh, uh, your fellow man uh, and your relationship with your fellow man uh, that keeps you on a cutting edge. Uh, and if you're in a healthy body of believers, uh, they will begin to iron sharpens iron and it'll begin to keep you uh, on the cutting edge. We have a man named the Apostle Paul. And uh, he writes uh, in the book of Second Timothy uh, these tremendous words, uh, he says to Timothy, this young pastor in Ephesus, uh, Timothy, rebuke, exhort, reprove with all long suffering and doctrine. Now, this is a generation. I heard a song. I don't, I'm not sure where I heard it or, or just exactly who, uh, who but the, the essence of it was. I'm not a musician. Musos are all in a breed of their own. I'm not a muso. But the words of this song were, don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me what to do. Well, I want to tell you that unless somebody can tell you what to do, then you're going to miss God a million miles, uh, and you're not going to make a significant impact uh, in this life uh, for God so that you can live life and look back and say, I have made an impact. I have significantly influenced uh, human personality. Listen to this quote. I love this quote uh, because this is the aim of every believer is to 
be significant in life. Listen to this quote. Bear with me for a moment. From my earliest years, I have admired people who live their lives in the shadows. They often feel the pressure of much responsibility, yet they bear up under it without seeking to be noticed. They do great work. Thanks to their God-given skills and seasoned experience, many fill significant roles and contribute greatly to the accomplishment of important tasks, uh, all the while remaining virtually anonymous. Without applause and usually without public awareness, these faithful men and women press on, knowing that their names will never be in lights. To be honest about it, they'd feel uncomfortable if they were. All that attention and acknowledgement makes them nervous. They don't do what they do to be noticed or to call attention to themselves. They do it because it's their role to fill. Better stated, it's their calling. Quietly and efficiently, they serve and give themselves. The world is a better place because of them. As the song goes, these are the wind, wind beneath the, our wings. They're the unsung heroes in the battle. The folks who do the work behind the scenes, the people who pick up the pieces, the ones who make, you, make sure everything in the project flows freely. Now this evening as we're here, this is a Bible conference. We challenge pastors and workers uh, for the harvest field, plant churches. Uh, but just in this passing moment, uh, I want to give credit to who really makes it the gospel go, and that's the people that are in our congregations. Uh, I preach in many places. I have the privilege of preaching crusades sometimes with many hundreds of people in these crusades, uh, and I'm always reminded uh, that I didn't produce these people that are there. It's the people in the congregations who have labored, witnessed, worked, been faithful, uh, and have brought crowds of people that I speak to uh, that can get healed, uh, can get saved. These are the behind-the-scenes people who are making a significant impact uh, in life uh, and are actually the ones that make our congregations function. These are the people that sometimes are abused by pastors that they have enabled to live well and contribute to their support who reward them by abuse. These are the people who furnish the dynamic that makes the gospel of Jesus Christ available to the multitudes uh, that need God. In passing, I want to make one other comment. There are in this building pastor's wives. Pastor's wives generally are unacclaimed. They generally are unappreciated. They always are the target of criticism and, uh, uh, and uh, a critical eye and judgment. These are the people who are behind the scenes of a pastor that encourages him, that helps him along the way. Oh, I know that sometimes they're... Uh, how many of you know that women are smarter than men? <laughs> well, that's true. They're smarter than men. The difficulty, they had been, just haven't been put in charge. And I get a call occasionally, and I know that you know better how to do this, and occasionally uh, we have women that want to take over, say, you, you know, you... you, you why did you do that stupid thing? And they think they could do it better and uh, they make life miserable for their husband. But there are many pastors' wives and some of them are sitting here tonight. You're the unsung hero in the church. You furnish the resource behind the scenes. When your husband has been assaulted, battered and bruised, uh, you're the one that says, uh, that's okay. I believe in you. You know, you need one person in life that believes in you. How many of you know that? And having said that tonight, uh, we need to give credit to pastors' wives uh, 
who behind the scenes have sacrificed, have given themselves, have followed, have been able to serve and been able to reinforce their husband so that he can be a pastor and make an impact and live a life of significance. I want every head bowed. I want every eye closed. As we're pausing for a moment in this service,